So we're going to be looking into the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is a binding international instrument and it is binding upon the executive powers here in Canada. In Article 4 we read the following, In time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation, and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, the states, parties to the present covenant, may take measures derogating from their obligations under the present covenant, to the extent strictly required by the complexity of the situation, provided that such measures are not inconsistent with their other obligations under international law and do not involve discrimination solely on the ground of race, color, sex, language, religion, or social origin. So here we're seeing first and foremost that this operates only during a time of emergency and that during a time of emergency, certain rights and freedoms can be set aside, can be limited. The state party, the executive powers, can negate or fall away or cast aside their obligations to certain rights and freedoms. Subsection 2, no derogation from Articles 6, 7, 8, 11, 15, 16, and 18 may be made under this provision. All right, so the covenant just listed and enumerated certain rights and freedoms. And they said specifically that under this provision, Article 4, when there's an emergency, the state party, Canada, America, the executive powers, they cannot use this Article 4 to limit and abridge the rights mentioned in Article 6, 7, 8, 11, 15, 16, and 18. So they cannot use this article here for to set aside the rights we find in the, in the subsequent articles. All right, so just because the article of law here says that in a time of emergency, the rights enumerated in subsection two cannot be limited or abridged by using the declaration of emergency, some would contend right now, some would say, oh, so I guess that means that the article six, seven, eight, 11, 15, 16, and 18, they represent my fundamental rights and freedoms and those are the freedoms that can never be limited or abridged. If you thought that way, you would be guilty of putting the cart before the horse. Because technically, this is not what that verse is declaring. It is simply saying that the rights enumerated in the articles that I just mentioned, they cannot be limited or abridged by calling on Article 4, by claiming there is, an, there is a national emergency. It does not mean that the right cannot be limited itself in another way, just that the right cannot be limited under a declaration of emergency. So we saw that in a time of emergency under Article 4, that Article 18 was protected. And it said you cannot use the emergency situation to limit or abridge the rights that we find in Article 18. So when we go and we look in Article 18, this is what we find. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right shall include freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice and freedom either individually or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. Article 18, subsection 3. Freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Notice in Article 18 that the subject or player being brought forth is an everyone, and this everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Now they use a personal pronoun in the second sentence when it says, this right shall include freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. His choice. We can clearly understand that the player here, everyone, is a man or a woman. And that man or a woman has the right to adopt a belief of his or her choice. That's why they use the personal pronoun of his. Freedom to manifest one's religions in this article of law is subject to limitations. A limitation can be placed upon the exercise of your right of religion or the exercise of your right of your consciousness. I gave a little example before. So we talked about if a Muslim 
wanted to exercise their right of religion and claim that on behalf of Allah, they want to de destroy or tear down Western civilization, perhaps by using a bomb, this would not be acceptable. And in Canadian domestic law and in American domestic law, you would have statutory powers, regulations, that would not allow an individual to exercise such a right. There would be a limitation or abridgment placed upon that religious right. And that limitation would fall under the necessity to protect public safety. If your religion was declaring that you need to kill individuals who do not believe the same structure or doctrines that you believe, then there would be statutory power and regulations to protect the safety of the public that said you could not exercise that right or that belief, even though your religion may be teaching it, and even though you may wholeheartedly believe it, we have a statutory power, a regulation, that will not allow you to do that. We have placed a limitation upon the exercise of your religion. Looking further into Article 18, subsec subsection 3, it says that they can place a limitation that is prescribed by law that is necessary to protect public safety, public order, or public health during a health emergency. If there is an emergency, a pandemic, that is affecting the public health, then they can add limitations and abridgments to the rights that are found here in Article 18. Looking into a statutory power in Alberta, Religious Societies Land Act. This is basically the same all across our provinces in Canada. Article 1, it says, In this act, a church building means a church, chapel, or meeting house, or a residence for the minister. Incorporated congregation means a congregation incorporated pursuant to Part 2. So we'll go look at Part 2 in a second. A member means with respect to the congregation of a church or religious denomination a person who by constitution or practice of the church or religious denomination is entitled to vote in respect of church business so we're seeing that member means with respect to the congregation of a church or another religious denomination it's a person who has the right to vote when church business is being handled those who belong to a religious organization will understand what I'm saying right now because once a year or twice a year, your pastor will hold the church business and the congregation will vote on issues that, that need to be voted on. This is the operation of law that you are seeing transpire. So if you're in a religious organization and once a year they're holding a business meeting and you are being asked to vote in that business meeting, then you are considered a member of that incorporated body. Part 2, which is Article 12, subsection 1. When a congregation of a church or religious denomination, not otherwise incorporated, desires to be incorporated for the purpose of holding and dealing with real and personal property, a meeting of the congregation may be called for the purpose of considering the proposed incorporation. If you're just meeting in someone's house with a group of people, to exercise your religious right, then this article of law doesn't apply to you. This is specifically applying to those, to those denominations that have already purchased a building and have a congregation and are holding religious services. It is saying that if a religious organization, a body of members, want to hold real property, such as a building or instruments, then they have to become incorporated under the enactment. Article 14, subsection 1 and 2. The incorporation of the congregation takes effect on the date 
of the incorporation mentioned in the certificate of incorporation, the members of the congregation, together with the other persons who from time to time become members of the corporation, become, on incorporation, a corporation under the name contained in the Declaration of Incorporation. Very clearly articulated, it states that the members of the congregation become, on incorporation, a corporation under the name contained in the Declaration of Incorporation. We saw in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights under Article 18, the right to exercise your religion and your conscience was given to the subject or player of everyone, that being a man or a woman. And we saw that there was a personal pronoun used of his indicating the subject and player. Now when you come to the statutory power, the regulation, the enactment, we see that what's transpiring is that a religious body is considered a corporate body under law, and the members of the corporate body, of the religious body, are considered incorporated into that corporate body. The law no longer recognizes you as a man or woman under your full, full legal capacity, but recognizes you now as a statutory creature exercising statutory rights as an incorporated officer of the corporate body, whatever it may be, whatever the church name or the religious organization may be. Again, so we see how international law affords us the right and the freedom, and then when you come into domestic law, the enactment and the regulation removes or limits and abridges that freedom. International law allowed for limitation on the right and freedom, but it only gave certain context in order for the right or freedom to be limited. And they used that context in Canada here to create these enactments to now recognize you, as I said before, as a statutory creature with limited rights and freedoms. Article 1. This is the Ontario Religious Freedoms Act. I'm going to read it, and I want to see if you catch it before I make a qualification. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference, provided the same be not made for an excuse of, for acts of licentiousness or a justification of practices inconsistent with the peace and safety of the province, is by the constitution and laws of this province assured to all Her Majesty's subjects within the same. So the free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship is assured to all Her Majesty's subjects within the same. So in law, who is the one or what is the one that is exercising a religious right? Is it a man or a woman under a full legal capacity or is it a statutory creature, one that is a subject and servant of Her Majesty? Here, here we clearly see that the free exercise and enjoyment of religious rights are given to Her Majesty's subject, statutory creature. Our religious right, an individual's religious right, and an individual's freedom of conscience can be set aside and will be set aside during a time of emergency, during a time of pandemic, when public health is in disarray, when public health is threatened. The International Covenant bring forth the right for the domestic state party, for the executive powers, to place such a limitation and abridgment upon those rights. Further, in domestic law, we see that rather than acknowledging or recognizing you under your full legal capacity before the law when exercising a religious right, you are being seen as a statutory creature with limited capabilities controlled by enactments and regulations. Men and women, perhaps even children, listen up, because what I'm about to say is extremely important. Remember how we saw in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in Article 4, that during a time of emergency, they listed a set of rights that they cannot limit or abridge under the emergency. It did not mean that the right itself could not be limited or abridged. It simply meant that during a time of emergency, these rights cannot be limited and abridged 
under that excuse directly. One of those articles w was Article 7. So we're going to look at Article 7 right now. And in Article 7, it reads as follows. No one, now notice the subject or player. It didn't say person, it didn't say people, it didn't say everyone. It qualified it by saying no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. In particular, no one shall be subjected without his free consent to medical or scientific experimentation. All right, so the no one at the beginning of the article is obviously a man or a woman, a human being. Because when we further read into the article, we find that the personal pronoun is being brought forth again. It says without his, his free consent. So we know the subject or player is a living being. Secondarily, we need to notice that this article of law ends abruptly. There's no more qualification to these rights or to what's being expressed within Article 7. When we looked into Article 18 of the Covenant, we saw the right was enumerated, and then after the right was enumerated, a subsequent paragraph was put forth that said a limitation and abridgment can be placed upon these rights of religious and consciousness, but only during these specific cer certain situations. However, here in Article 7, we're not finding that. There's no limitation or abridgment that can be placed upon this right directly. Neither can an emergency place a limitation or abridgment upon this right. I'll qualify that a little bit deeper by going on and saying that in Article 4, yes, there is an operation of law available to the state party if they wanted to try and limit and abridge Article 7, and that operation of law would be to contact the United Nations and tell them that they want to abstain from Article 7 for a certain period of time due to certain circumstances, and they would have to provide a date on when they would allow this Article 7 to operate again. That's the only way the state party could do it. However, even if the state party did it, it would not take away my right, my fundamental rights and freedoms as a man or a woman to invoke this operation of law that's operating in Article 7. Because remember, in the Constitution Act, Article 26, it says that there are other rights and free freedoms that are guaranteed to us that are not enumerated in the Constitution Act. So if we were trying to use Article 7 here in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and bring it into Article 7 of the Constitution Act, that would work well. But if they tried to, t to, to, to place a limitation or abridgment upon this right here in Article 7, the only way they can do it is, as I explained, if they contacted the United Nations and declared there was an, an emergency and that they want to abstain from their obligation under Article 7, the United Nations could temporarily give them disability, but they have, Canada would have to provide a date as to when this, this right would come back into play, would come back into existence. So even that worst case scenario, if they did that, which I don't think they're ever going to do that, but if they did that, it still would not remove our right as a man or a woman under Section 7 of the Constitution Act, and we could bring in our rights under Article 26 of the Constitution Act, because now Article 7 here in ICCPR would no longer be in existence. Now, that's a what-if situation. That's not what's transpiring right now. Right now, as it stands, we see in Article 7, it says a man or a woman, they have the right not to be subjected without their consent to medical or scientific experimentation. The coronavirus vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccination that they're going to be putting into operation is an experimental operation. It's something that they are trying. They are experimenting with this. They want to try to do this in order to stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The medical community, all involved in the medical community under law, under statutory law, what they are doing is they are practicing medicine. They are, are making experimentations with medicine. This whole situation surrounding the vaccine, it's an experimental measure used during a time of public health emergency. All right, so let's run this down. We have freedom of right for religion and a freedom of right concerning our consciousness, our conscience. This is enumerated or listed or brought forth in Canadian law in the Constitution Act, Article 2. 
The origins of these rights are stemming from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article, tw Article 18. We see in Article 18, they list and, enu and enumerate the right, but then they also allow for limitation and abridgment to be placed directly upon those rights. We further saw that any time you claim to be exercising a religious right, what you're actually exercising is a right or a duty or a privilege granted to you through a statutory power, through an enactment. Because when you claim to be exercising a religious right, you are actually considered an incorporated statutory creature. As a statutory creature, during a time of public health emergency, more or extra limitations and abridgments can be, can be placed upon your religious right or your right of your conscience. So in a normal time, when your right of religion or right of consciousness can protect you against certain actions of the state party, of the executive parties Canada, in a time of emergency or in a time of declaration of public health emergency, those rights will no longer operate. And this is an operation of law that the Canadian domestic lawmakers have the, if you will say, right to do. They can do this. Further to this, when we look into Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, we find that the subject and or player was a human being, a man or a woman. More specifically, it quoted the male here because it, the personal pronoun was his, but what the author was trying to express was that this was applying to a living being. And a living being means a man, woman, or child. This article of law operates for an individual under their full legal capacity, under all of their human rights and freedoms. It is not to be limited or abridged and cannot be limited or abridged. Within it, we find the fundamental right of a man or woman not having to be subjected without agreeing to it, without giving their consent to medical or scientific experimentation. It is very clear that the state parties, the governments of the world, are taking experimental measures to try and combat the COVID-19, the coronavirus. In my last video, Vaccination and Your Consent, I spoke quite in depth on the fact that your religious right and your right to your conscience freedom will not protect you, and I explained why and I emphasize more in this video tonight. I also mentioned in the prior video and in this video about Section 7 rights of the Constitution Act of Canada 1982, that Section 7 only applies for a man or a woman seeking to exercise their natural fundamental rights and freedoms. And in Section 7 of the Constitution Act of Canada, we find a limited amount of natural rights and freedoms that are enumerated or listed therein. However, the courts have already ruled that just because only a certain number of our rights and freedoms are listed in Article 7. It doesn't mean that they do not exist. Now here in the International Covenant, under Article 7, we find the player or subject being a man or a woman, and that man or a woman does not have to be subjected without their consent to a vaccination. That's why this Article 7 could be applied or pulled in under Article 7 of the Constitution Act to give you your excuse, your proviso, your remedy. Even if hypothetically Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was not in operation, it doesn't matter because what's being brought forth in that Article 7 is actually teaching us and showing us a fundamental human right that we all possess. And just by learning that article of law tonight, that Article 7, you're learning that you possess this right this fundamental right, and you can exercise this fundamental right irregardless if it was not even written in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's the lack of knowledge prior to this that forbade you from exercising this right or being able to stand with or under this right.